Well, let me say good evening. We thank God for you on this beautiful Wednesday, March the 13th. And we are grateful unto God that he has given us another opportunity to study his word. For the word of God shall stand forever. The flower and the grass and all therein shall fade away. But the word of our God shall never fade away. It shall always stand. God bless you on this beautiful, beautiful Wednesday. We hope and pray that you are blessed of God and you at this time, we want to encourage you who are viewing us, if you will be so kind as to share this Bible study with family and friends, and that's what I'm getting ready to do. Uh, I want to share this with those of you that are near and far, and as we do this, as we post these sharings, uh, we want to encourage you to do likewise. My brothers and my sisters, if there was ever a time that we need to hear a word from the Lord. I declare now is that time. Amen. Now is that time. And so if you will be so kind as to turn with us to the 21st chapter, 21st chapter of the book of Leviticus. And today we're going to share with you very briefly uh, rules for the priests. That's right. Rules for the priests. Uh, the backdrop would have us to know that the children of Israel have been delivered from Egypt and they are now in the wilderness and they are worshiping God in the tabernacle, which was a portable tent uh, that was consecrated and dedicated to the worship of God. Unlike the institutionalized church today, uh, we come to buildings. They came to a tabernacle. Uh, they were not allowed to go into the tabernacle. Uh, the priest was the representative, the great high priest. And the great high priest had other priests who assisted him, who assisted him. And this is very important for us to be mindful that the work of the church is not to, hear me, be tied up, wrapped up, and contingent upon one person. Teamwork still makes the dream work. And so for those of you that have been with us, you know our goal and objective is to read the entire Bible, all 66 books. That's right. And as we read the Bible, uh, we're going to highlight uh, various thoughts. Uh, we're going to try to do our best to put God first in our study. And we ask that you would pray with and for us. The word of the Lord is still real and powerful, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes, it is. I have decided under the direction of the Holy Spirit to preach a new series, and that series is entitled, What Happened to the Bible? What Happened to the Bible? And so we ask that you would join us on Sunday mornings as we share the series. Uh, the Lord is blessing, and he's stirring up the gift. That's right, stirring up the gift that is within us. And so again, I want you to join me and uh, pray with and for us as we continue our study. Let us pray. Dear God, we love you. Thank you for this time of study. Thank you for your word, for your word is truth. We ask that it would have free course. And Father God, we're asking if you would to touch the life and the lives of those who are viewing. And then, Father God, we ask if you would to break every yoke, break every chain. In Jesus' name, this is my prayer. And then, Father God, I pray in Jesus' name that someone's heart would be lifted, someone's mind, Father God, would be renewed, because miracles do happen. And we understand with miracles, oh God, there is a process. So we love you dearly. We appreciate you, Father God, for tolerating us and allowing us, again, this privilege and this opportunity to share your word. Lord, I pray that the word of God will have impact across this world, and that lives, Father God, will surrender, hearts will be changed, Father God, that those who are unchurched will, Father God, yield and unite with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Father God, we'll be so careful to say thank you. Now, Lord God, we love you dearly, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name, amen, and thank God. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about ready to start 
And once you turn in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 21, and again, we're dealing with the subject of holiness, okay? Holiness, the standard of God. God has given the people uh, instructions before they enter to the land of Canaan, and he is not going to omit leadership. It's very important that leadership sets the tone. Hello. Uh, that leadership sets the example. The leadership is to represent God, representatives of God, okay? They stood in the gap between God and the people, but they had to adhere and obey God's order. They had to hear that, and they had to obey that. They had to make sure that that which they uh, exemplified uh, would not bring shame to God, even when it came down to their dress, their demeanor, their relationships. And God is letting the priest know that you will enter into a strange land, and you will see a lot of strange religions, uh, heathenistic practices. There will be pseudo-priests that will be worshiping idol gods. You'll see some conduct that is totally heathenistic and ungodly. And he is warning the priests, the leaders, do not emulate them. Do not do as they do. Uh, I'm setting you aside to be different. You represent me. And so let's get right into the word of God. And let's see what the Lord would have for us to know on this beautiful Wednesday. Leviticus is the book. The chapter is 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. Now this is important. Uh, deaf or dead bodies represented sin, decaying. And this is important for us to be mindful of that because of sin, we have death and disease and sickness in our land today. And so anyone that touched a dead body, God said, that's defiled. So he's letting the priest know, uh, we don't want you, I don't want you to do that, okay? Now, <clears throat> verse number two, but for his kin that is nearer to him, that is, for his mother and for his father and for his sons and for his daughter and for his brother, and for his sister, a virgin, who is near unto him, which he has no husband for her, may he be defiled. So in other words, which has had no husband for her, he may be defiled. It meant that the priests were not to, again, touch a dead body, with the exception of their close relatives. Both physical and spiritual death, ladies and gentlemen are the result of sin. Hence, this is a prohibition. Okay? Verse number 4, chapter 21 of Leviticus. He shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. Verse 5. They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. And God again is letting them know, you will see this in the heathenistic religion and practices you'll see this but you are not to do this all right um, the heathen would shave his head and cut his hair and do all kind of strange um, uh, things to their bodies uh, when a loved one would die but he said don't do that in other words don't worship the dead are y'all listening to me Verse 6, they shall be holy unto the Lord their God, and not profane the name of the, their God, for the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God they do offer, therefore they shall be holy. Again, Leviticus is pointing to, please keep this in mind, Christ and him crucified. They shall not take a wife who is a whore or profane, neither shall they take a woman that has been divorced from a husband, for he's holy unto his God. Now, what that simply is dealing with the offsprings, that the natural birth, the natural origin of God, husband and wife. Please hear me when I say this. Um, God is saying your offsprings will be affected by the sin, watch this, that you commit. You've heard of the sins of the children. All right, well, the sins of the parents, do pass on to their children. And so what he is, what God is instructing the priest to do, you set the example. Are y'all listening to me? Verse number eight, 
You shall sanctify him therefore, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy unto you. For I, the Lord, which sanctify you, am holy. The daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, prostitute is what he's dealing with. Prostitution is the oldest sin, one of the oldest sins. Um, as far as humanity is concerned, it ain't nothing new. It's been around a long time. And he says here in verse number nine, that the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profanes her father, profanes her father. She should be burnt with fire. Now that may seem harsh, but what God is doing, God is saying, if anyone commits these heathenistic practices, I'm going to make an example out of them. Are y'all listening to me? And you know as well as I know that of all people within the church, of all families within the church, that the preacher and his family, they live in a fishbowl. Um, their children live in a fishbowl. The wives live in a fishbowl. The preacher lives in a fishbowl. Somebody's always watching you. Oh, yes, they are. If you're in leadership, they're always watching you. And my brothers and my sisters, at one time, you knew a preacher when you saw a preacher. Uh, you, you, knew, you, you knew a preacher by the way he talked, the way he dressed, the way he carried himself, his behavior, his associations. You knew God's vessel, God's mouthpiece, when you would see one and you reverence and respect him. Not worship him, but you respect him. And the reason why that respect was so high is because he represented who? God. He represented God. In other words, he was the mouthpiece of God, the vessel of God, and still is, by the way. He is the voice of God. Amen. When I say the voice of God, he gives the word of God, and he is to be a channel of holiness. Please hear me. I didn't say perfect, but of holiness. Now, my brothers and my sisters, I want you to be mindful that we live in a time now you don't know a preacher from a pimp. You don't know a preacher from a player. You don't know a preacher, amen, from a hustler. Oh, my God, it's, it's so uh, discombobulated now. Uh, their mannerism, their behavior, their conduct, their dress, uh, their relationships, their affiliations. I mean, it is off the chain. And this gives leeway and excuses, believe it or not, for others to what? Fall. That's right. Uh, leaders oftentimes become stumbling blocks before the people of God, because if they see the leader do it, they feel that it's okay to do it, that it's permissible, and they justify their behavior as such. And so God is saying to the priest, I'm letting you know now, I'm calling you to be different as a leader, and you are to practice holy living, holy conduct. Amen. You cannot act and do as the world does. You cannot be as them. I, the Lord, your God, he says it's all over. Throughout this text, 15 times, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. Now, we go from the priest to the high priest. You know, everybody wants to sit in the big chair. Really? Do you? Verses 10 through 15, and I'm going to come back and do some highlights, and then I'll bid you adieu. And he who is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who was consecrated, listen at that, to put on the garment shall not uncover his head nor rend his clothes. Now the instructions are shifting from what we might refer to as the ordinary priest or his assistants to the high priest. Even if a loved one died, he was not to alter his appearance at all. He was not to stop performing and carrying out the duties and instructions that God had commanded him to do. There is much that is required of a leader, ladies and gentlemen. In all aspects of life, if you are a father, a grandfather, a mother, a grandmother, or a leader in your community, or a leader in your household as a child of God, God holds you to a standard. Please hear that. He holds you to a standard. If you belong to a church, amen, all of us are leaders in some aspect or another, and we carry influence. Yes, we do. We carry influence. And yes, too much is given, much is required. Much is required. Notice here, he says in verse 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, Leviticus chapter 21, he says, <clears throat> Neither shall he go into any dead body, nor defile himself for his father, for his mother. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. So what this is stating is that even if he hears the death of a new relative, 
Whatever duties he is performing in the sanctuary must not be stopped. Again, God is priority. God is supreme. And I've learned that when you are a servant of God, as long as you handle his business, guess what? He'll handle your business. Tweet that. Watch this, verse 13. He shall take a wife in her virginity. Verse 14, a widow or a divorced woman or a profane or a harlot, prostitute, these shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. Now, the ordinary priest could marry a widow, but watch this. The high priest could only marry a virgin. Verse 15, neither shall he profane his seed, there it is, among his people, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. When the father who was a high priest died, guess what? His oldest son. You see, you see what God, God is dealing with generational holiness. Watch this. His oldest son was to be the next high priest. So they were to prepare from the time they were children. They were to live a sanctified life, a holy life. Preparation determines your destination. Are y'all listening to me? Verse 16 through 24. Notice the rules, the standard. Notice the requirement of those who are in spiritual leadership. Notice what God says to them. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of your seed in their generation who has any blemish, notice this, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. See, holiness becomes God's house forever. Are y'all listening to me? And I've always been mindful and very, very, very um, prayerful and um, <laughs> very concerned about the behavior in the house of God. Um, whether you are a priest or you are a worshiper of God, when you come into God's house, that's just not any house. No, 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 no. That particular house, church, that has been consecrated and set aside for the use of God is to be respected as such. And you and I have seen some behavior that is unbecoming from the pulpit to the door. Ladies and gentlemen, please hear me, boys and girls. The standard of holiness is still the standard of holiness. Conduct and behavior will get you in trouble with God. Are y'all listening to me? Oh, yes, it will. Especially in the house of prayer. So those who practice, amen, a chaste life or a chastened life, or a holy life, or a righteous life, they don't have a problem with respecting God's house. They don't have a problem walking in the newness of Christ, even outside of the church, even more so when they come to the house of prayer. There's a certain reverence and a certain respect that you ought to maintain at any time, even if you are the pastor, even if you are the elder, the bishop, the overseer. You must always be mindful of your conduct. I have been challenged on many, many, many levels as a spiritual leader to retaliate like a heathen, to carry myself like a heathen, uh, to respond like a heathen. And oftentimes it will appear that uh, the leader is naive, the leader is timid, the leader is afraid, uh, the leader is shy, the leader, amen, is um, somewhat reserved uh, with responding in the same manner. But listen to me my brothers and my sisters, you cannot, amen, succumb to such behavior and leadership. You must always be mindful of the fact that you are a representative of God. And although, although your flesh, and I ain't going to say my flesh, has not said to me, you, Tyler, you need to do something about that. Tyler, you need to take that matter into your own hands. Tyler, 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 Tyler. But the Spirit of God convicts me and restrains me from behaving and responding in an ugly way. And I have seen it, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, 31 years serving as a pastor, I have seen people with, amen, ungodly demeanors. You have witnessed it as well. People who are uh, unconscious about what they say, uh, how they act, their demeanor, uh, how they carry themselves uh, in God's house. Uh, and in their own lives, I've seen ugly stuff happen to them. Oh, my God, ugly stuff. And when God is your problem, you've got a problem. Don't think that God won't put something ugly on you. And I've learned, amen, 
turn certain people and situations and personalities and remarks uh, over to the Lord. Over to the Lord. And he'll do a better job on them than you and I can ever do. Are y'all listening to me? And I'm not saying sick Jesus on them. Ladies and gentlemen, you ain't got to do that. Uh, you just submit that person, that personality, that issue, whatever it is to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to handle this. I need you to deal with this according to your will. God is holy. God's nature, his attribute is holy, y'all. And by his own nature, please hear me, he will deal with sin. Whether you pray or don't pray, whether you, amen, uh, want something to happen or not want something to happen, God is a holy God. And he would not allow sin to go unchecked. You ought to thank God right now for the grace and the mercy of God. You ought to thank God for the blood of Jesus that covers and washes away all sin. If it had not been for the grace and mercy of God, none of us, do you hear me? None of us would be alive and doing well today. None of us would be saved. None of us would be forgiven. But we are not to play God. We're not to play God. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense them. And he will deal with them. Oh, yes, he will. Whether it's done in secret or whether he does it publicly. And, you know, the hellraiser and the devil and the haters, amen, they may go on as if nothing happens. Amen. As big and bad as they think they are. But I promise you, amen, God is dealing with them. And so he's telling the priest here, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm setting the criteria. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm setting rules and conduct. Amen. And, and, and order for you to carry yourself because you're going to be under great duress. Uh, you're going to be dealing with a lot of pressure, a lot of temptation. What is that saying? The higher the level, the greater the devil. Are y'all listening to me? That's right. The closer you walk with God, the greater the temptation will be. The more you seek to serve God, the greater the challenges will be. The more you try to do right by God, the more temptation, amen, to do evil and to respond and to retaliate. It's coming. It's coming. So God is saying to the priest here, you set the example. Don't be ghetto because they're ghetto. Don't respond like they do. Don't mimic and take on these behaviors and these patterns that you will see over in Canaan. You're going to see this. And we learn behavior from somebody. We learn. Yes, we do. We learn behavior from someone. Amen. My brothers and my sister psychologists teach that pessimistic thinking is learned behavior. Something has happened to that person uh, that has caused them to think like they think, to act like they to act, to behave like they behave. And God is saying, I want you to set the example. Hello, somebody. You see, God is not only going to deal with us according to, amen, the the things we ought not to have done, but also for those that we have caused a stumbling block. Hello. We've caused others to fall by the wayside. We have retaliated. We've done some things that God is saying, you shouldn't have done that. And that will cause someone, hello somebody, to think that I can do it because you did it. I can say it because you say it. I can go there because you go there. I can act that way because you act that way. And ladies and gentlemen, although I know every tub has to sit on its own bottom, and everyone should give an account of his or her sin. I get that. But do not, please hear me, do not cause another person to stumble by your behavior, by your practices, by your demeanor. It's best just to walk away. Amen. It's best to look at them sometime and just say nothing uh, and go on about your business. Yes, I'm not saying that you don't have rights and I'm not saying that you don't, amen, have a voice to speak. But did you not know that sometimes Amen. Your respect and your manner and your integrity and how you carry yourself speaks volumes, speaks volumes. People don't always watch. Watch me now. Listen to me. It's not so much that people watch what you do, but hear me when I tell you, people are paying attention, you got it, as to what you don't do. Hello, the choices and the decisions you make. They're watching saying, no, I've never known them to do that. I that's out of their character. That's not them. And that's why sometimes you hear things and you're shocked. You're like, oh, no, I would have never thought that, you know, Joe Blow would do this or Mary Susie Doe would do that. You could have told me that, you know. But sometimes, hear me, sometimes the flesh will rise up. So God is telling them here in Leviticus chapter 21, 
There's a standard. The Bible teaches, touch not my anointing, do my prophet no harm. Why did God say that? Because God is, is very clear. He's very clear in his word. I will deal with my preachers. I will deal with my leaders. Don't play God. Amen. I've seen and you've seen it. You've heard it. How people have dug ditches for God's leaders. People have slandered the names of God's leaders. Uh, people have taken God's leaders to court. Uh, people have fought God's leaders. They have been very disrespectful to God's leaders. And although a man is not perfect, he is not God. Although a woman is not perfect, you have women of God. You have women leaders as well. They're not perfect. And yes, we do things and we fall short, but that does not give anyone the right to play God. Well, I'm going to get them. I'm going to do them in. I'm going to this. I'm gonna... Yeah, God going to get you. Amen. That's what he's going to do. God going to get you. Now watch this. Notice this. Notice how God sets the tone. Here's what God is saying. Here's what God is requiring of his leader. Amen. Now we're dealing with the high priest. Watch this. The Lord said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, notice, not Aaron and his sons, not Aaron and his assistants, but Aaron. Why is it specified Aaron in verse number 17? Because Aaron is the high priest. And the high priest was the one designated to go into the holies of holies on behalf of the people. He is to offer sacrifices for himself, confession for himself, and on behalf of the people. That's the high priest. Nobody else could go into the holies of holies. And he could only go once a year. He had to dress a certain way. He had to eat certain foods. He had certain rituals before he could present himself before God. And if he missed one T that he, if he did not cross one T and did not dot one I, God dealt with him. And the Bible is clear. God would strike him down. Yes, Lord, he would strike him down. The high priest would wear a rope around him with a bell tied to it. And the bell, the bell would be dingling as he would go into the, the holies of holies. And if by chance that he did not follow what God had stated, his instruction, God is a God of order. I keep saying that over and over again. If he did not follow what God said and instructed him to do, regardless what the people thought, regardless what the people voted on or didn't vote on, if he fell short of what God told him to do, God would take his life. That's how severe these instructions and these guidelines were for the high priest. Why? God is pointing to Jesus Christ who is our great high priest, who did not have a blemish, who was sinless. Hello, somebody, who was tempted in all manners as we are, but yet what? Without sin. Are y'all listening to me? And so when the great, when the high priest would go into the temple, uh, when Aaron would go, Aaron had to make sure that he did exactly what God said and followed it to the T because he's going in on behalf of the people and he is representing God. If by chance, remember I talked about the rope that was tied around his waist. If by chance he did not, that bell, ding, 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 it would stop ringing. And that told the attendants who were outside of the holies of holies, we better pull him on out of there because God just struck him down. He would go into the holies of holies and he would sprinkle blood. It was filled with incense, uh, the smoke in the holies of holies. So when he would go into the presence of God, would come, God would come and dwell upon the mercy seat. He would go in once a year and he would confess his sin, offer up sacrifice for himself and sacrifice on behalf of the people. And these sacrifices had to be done a certain, follow a certain manner and ritual, a certain order. God is a God of order. I don't know where we get this stuff from, that we can just throw anything together Within and just come with any type of attitude. I don't care how emotional a person may be or get. I don't care how sincere a person may be or get. There is a standard with God, ladies and gentlemen. And you have to approach. These are God's rules. <laughs> this is God. Amen. And he answers to no one. Hello, somebody. He's God all by himself. Ain't that what the old preacher said? Notice what he says. Now, the High priest, Aaron, here it is. Speak unto Aaron, saying, verse 17, 
Whosoever he be of your seed in their generation, who has any blemish, let him not approach, there it is, to offer the bread of his God. All right? So not only is the house of God to be reverenced and respected as a holy place, but also, notice this, ladies and gentlemen, the high priest represented holiness, and God demanded an unblemished priest and an unblemished sacrifice. That meant that when God commanded the people to bring sacrifices, they had to be very careful of the type of animal that they would bring before God. It couldn't be an animal with a broken foot. It couldn't be an animal that had a disease. It couldn't be an animal that had been uh, tarnished by any means. It had to be an animal without blemish. And God made sure that animals existed as today without blemishes. Are y'all listening to me? When I worked in the uh, armor packing house, I worked in a hog uh, warehouse. And, and we manufactured hogs. That's what we did. They would come in, come in off trucks on four legs and leave out in cans and in packages, bologna, and hot dogs, uh, pig feet, you name it, chitlins, uh, pork chops. Hello, somebody. <laughs> All that stuff we eat, it ain't good for us. But they had inspectors. And these inspectors would inspect these hogs. They would, any blemish, any tainting of that animal, they would pull it to a side, pull it to the side, and they would not process it. My brothers and sisters, if we do that, if mankind does that with animals for our consumption, how much more when you bring your offering? God is saying, bring me your best. And ladies and gentlemen, whatever you do for God, please do your best. The Bible says, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We should always strive for excellence. Excellence in our ministry. Excellence in our preaching. Excellence in our singing. Excellence in our worship. Excellence in our work ethic. Excellence in our ministry. Excellence in our mission. Excellence. Somebody say excellence. We should always strive for excellence. I did not say perfection. You will not be perfect, but you ought to bring God his best. Hello, somebody. And you ought to give God your best. Are y'all listening to me? It's time out for bringing these band-aid approaches to God. That's what got, you remember Cain and Abel? All right, that's what got him in trouble because Cain felt that he could bring God any type of offering and he had any type of attitude. Your attitude is indicative of your service. Your attitude is indicative of your work ethic. Your attitude is indicative of your worship, your ritual, your praise. Amen. Your service unto the Lord. Your attitude. Attitude has a lot to do with altitude. I'm going to give you this for free. The more, watch this, listen to me carefully. The more excellent, the better excellence that you strive in your attitude, the higher you would go in your altitude. I think I said something. You would go higher in your living. You would go higher in your mannerism. Are y'all listening to me? In your morals, in your principles, in your boundaries because of attitude, ladies and just the disposition of how we think and the choices we make. Attitude. Sin is an attitude. Are y'all listening to me? Please hear me. And I know we live in a world that has an I don't care ism attitude, but don't let that be you. And you hear people say, oh, I don't give it. I could care less. Don't you do that. Please don't. Please don't do that. We ought to care. Amen. We ought to strive to be better as a person and as an individual. There are people who are gifted. There are people who are talented. But are they good people? What type of attitude, amen, are you portraying as a child of God? Amen. All right. And so here's what we find here in Leviticus chapter what? Here we go. 21 and verse number 18. For whatsoever man he be who has a blemish, he shall not approach. Whoever it is. Now again, he's dealing with what? The high priest. All right. Those who what? That's right. Stand before God on behalf of themselves and the people. Notice here, a blind man disqualified. A lame man, a crippled man, disqualified. Notice this. Or he who has a flat nose, that means a, dis, a, a, a disembodied nose, okay, disfigured in any 
in any shape or form or anything superlicious, super loose, super florous, which means anything that is blemished. That's what that word means. Anything that is blemished or a man who is broken footed or broken handed or a crook back or dwarf or who ever has a blemish in his eye or be scurvy, a scab or has his stones, his testicles broken. Notice that. Yes, sir. Verse 21. No man who has a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come near to offer the offerings of, of the Lord made by fire. He has a blemish. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. Verse 22. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy. The sin offering. Here it is. The trespass offering and the meat offering. These are holy offerings unto the Lord. We've already been through our studies. We've studied what each offering represented, okay? So I'm not going to rehash that. Whole burnt offering and peace offerings. The law forbade a priest who was physically imperfect. This is what the text is saying, to exercise in his office. There's a standard. I tell my preachers all the time, you know, they want to preach. They want to stand before the people. They want to, but I always tell them. There's a certain criteria. There is an expectation that God has for you. You can't just stand because you want to stand up on a platform and, you know, represent God and the people. There's a certain standard. There are certain things I tell them, no, you can't do that. No, you can't have that. There are certain, I go critique, I critique them. I go behind them. I try to go before them. Uh, not so much to judge them, but to help them to understand who you are representing when you stand before the people. Amen, somebody. Y'all heard the term jack leg preacher? Well, you got a lot of jack leg preachers. You got a lot of jack leg leaders. You got a lot of pseudo leaders in religion. All right? In religion. Notice what he says. He has a blemish. He shall not come near to the offer the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of his God. Verse 22 of the most holy. Now, thank God for grace, which furnishes him the daily bread, give us this day our what? daily bread, that's grace. In other words, if he is to be blemished in some way, he could not serve as a priest. He could attend and do certain duties, but he couldn't do that duty, couldn't perform that function. There are certain levels of service, and there are certain requirements for those services. And sometimes people want to, you know, do something for three, six months and jump up and expect to do the service or carry the work out uh, in relationship to someone who is what? Been doing it for 20 and 30 years, and they, you know, all of a sudden they just want to be an overnight wonder. It doesn't work like that. You have to walk with God. Amen. And God is dealing with here, as we see, relationship. God desires to have a relationship with us, with his leaders, with his people. He desires that. And brothers and sisters, you know as well as I know, it's nothing like a phony, amen. It's nothing more draining than someone to betray you and mislead you and misguide you to believe that they are sincere and genuine. Hello, well, if you hurt and if someone has hurt you in that manner, how do you think God feels? Are you, are you listening to me? How do you think he feels? And so we want to think on these things, but also we want to apply these things to us. One has stated that the book of Leviticus is boring, it's old, it's outdated. I disagree. The book of Leviticus does have principles for us to live by today. Notice what it says in verse 23 and 24 of Leviticus chapter 21. Only he shall go into the veil, nor come near unto the altar. He can come near, but he can't, he can't go into the holies of holies. All right? Because he has a blemish, that he profane not my sacrifices, for I, the Lord, do sanctify them. And Moses told it unto Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel. Now, I'm going to do a recap of this, and then I'll bid you adieu. So glad to see so many of you joining us on this blessed Wednesday. Here we go. Leviticus 21. Here's your overview, okay? And there's much more to it. Um, as we study the Bible, as you can tell, uh, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that have been with me, I'm doing what is called topical study. Topical study simply means I'm just dealing with certain highlights and topics as it relates to the chapter. 
I'm not trying to do a deep uh, study. Uh, I'm not. That's not my goal. My goal is for you and me and all who are watching to be able to stand back and say in the very near future, I have read the entire word. I've been through the Bible. Now the Bible is going through me. Because there are a lot of people who read the Bible and have been through the Bible, but the Bible has not been through them. The word of God teaches, thy word have I what? Hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's where the word, amen, ought to abide. It's one thing to carry the Bible under your arm. I get that. But it's another thing, my brothers and my sisters, for the word to dwell in you. Amen. Amen. Now, the Lord forbade the priests to become ceremonial, unclean. Number one, he said, he said don't touch the dead. Don't touch a dead body. Uh, they were not allowed to participate directly in funerals. Coming into contact with what? Dead bodies. The Lord made an exception for close family members. Now, although the text does not mention priests' wives, it's likely that they will be included among the exceptions. So if a wife of a priest would die, it is believed that the priest could perform that and uh, touch that body. But in relationship to the dead, they are not to do it. Okay? Notice here in verses 5 through 9. Facial disfigurement, shaving heads and the edges of their beards, cutting their bodies in any way. This is in relationship to the ways of the world. Is it anything with grooming yourself? Is it anything from shaving and trimming yourself? No, God, that's not what God is saying. But in the heathenistic world, they would disfigure themselves and their hair and their appearances in dedication or in reverence to, watch this, listen to me carefully, false gods. Oh, yes, they would. False gods. They would do that. And these religious rituals they practice, actually, they believe by doing such, it will please these false gods. And God is saying, don't do that. No, don't worship the dead. Don't disfigure yourself and approach me in that manner. Hello, somebody. I am the Lord thy God. And although a lot of this is not explained in detail, God wanted to make sure that they understood his character, understood his instructions, because again, God is desiring a relationship with his people. Even today, God desires a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you and with me and so many others. Amen. I mean, God is open. God is saying, I'm stretching my hand out to you. I want you to come and, and get to know me. Amen. You ain't got to worry about God getting to know you. He already knows you. But he said, I want you to come and get to know me. Hello, somebody. It's, you know, first step, right, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But after believing in him and believing upon him, God is saying, now I want you to get to really know me. And in order to get to know someone, you got to spend time with them. Amen. You know the difference between a genuine and a fake. You know when somebody, amen, is for you or against you. You know when somebody wants to be around you and sincere and cares about you. Well, so it is with God, ladies and gentlemen. Are y'all with me? And so he didn't want them getting caught up in these heathenistic practices. And do we not see that in the world today? We see people mimicking what they see others do and how others dress and how others carry themselves. But there ought to be a standard. Amen. There ought to be a standard with you. There ought to be a boundary and a principle of how you carry yourself as a child of God. Notice here that the Lord is talking about the consecration of the body and the soul. How that is to be set aside. Don't marry women, listen to this, engaged in prostitution and who were divorced. Amen. This is dealing with the character of the woman that the leader chose. Notice this. A trait would be transferred into the seed. Hello, somebody. And God was very concerned, and still is, about generational curses. Now, I'm not saying that God does not love all people. He loves all people. I'm not saying that a prostitute or someone with a blemish is not going to be accepted by God. What I am saying 
in relationship to leadership. This is what God has commanded and directed the leaders to do. Why? God made it clear. You shall give birth and your seed, watch this, will continue to what? Practice and participate in procreation. And we all, you know, we have this all saying about babies, innocent babies, you know. But brothers and sisters, I'm going to say something sounds strange. Did you not know that there is no such thing? That's right. So I said, what are you talking about, Tyler? Did you not know that all who are born of a woman are born into sin and shaping in iniquity? And yes, I get it. The child, the baby, doesn't know the difference about a lot of life. And I get all of that. But hear me what I tell you. Did you not know? Hey, have you ever thought about why you always have to tell the child, no, stop, don't do, quit, don't talk back? Hey, Amen. You have to tap the little hands and pull them back because sin is aggressive. And sin is always reaching to do those things that are unbecoming. And so we are born in sin. Hello, somebody. But thank God that God has grace and mercy for kids and for me and you. Amen. Until they reach what we call the age of accountability, knowing the difference between right and wrong, where they're at that transition of development, watch this, where they can make wise decisions. Uh, as you well know, I'm in the school system and I talk to these kids. I'm in the middle school system. The, the schools, as people say, oh, I wouldn't deal with the middle school kids. But I, let me help you with something. These kids don't know. They haven't been taught. Many of them are not aware of certain principles and boundaries and mannerism. They weren't taught that. They, it's not a foundation at home. Most of them are raising themselves. And a lot of their behavior and conduct and mannerism, they are learning from others. And sometimes others could be a broad range from media uh, to culture, community, oh my God, peers, I could go on down the line. And they mimic that because they want to be accepted and they adapt to that. Whereas when you have those who are coming are brought up with a foundation, although they may make some unwise decisions, guess what? The seed has been planted, the seed of morals, the seed of mannerism, respect, and God, and integrity, work ethic. I can go on and on and on that has been embedded in them, they have a foundation to build upon. But a lot of children, please hear me, a lot of teenagers, they don't have it, ladies and gentlemen. They're not exposed to it. And we're starting to see grandparents jump in and try to reestablish these principles to help these children to know that's not the way to go. Amen. That's not the way to go. Just recently, I was riding down the street and my God, a uh, man and, and a woman, and I guess it was the children, he's got his music up, he's bumping and grinding, and yes, you could smell flocker, you could smell all kinds of smoke, everything. Kids in there bobbing, and you know, how are you going to tell that child that's wrong when that child is being brought up in that manner? You know that old saying, do as I say and not as I do? You can forget that. Amen. A lot of them are only practicing what they are accustomed to. They are adapting to it. And it is really, really, really heart-drenching to see that they, their position and their beliefs and their perspectives are so misconstrued and convoluted. I mean, it is, it's crazy. It's really crazy. And when you talk to them about God, they don't have an idea what you're talking about. Church and the Bible, they haven't even read a verse out of a Bible because they have not been taught. And so the principle here, um, from my perspective, what God is saying to the priests, to the leaders, make sure that your seed is pure. That's what he's saying. Uh, make sure that your seed has not been blemished. And although that may take place, and although it does take place, that still is no 100% guarantee that that child will turn out right. However, you can go to sleep knowing that you did what the Lord has instructed you to do. Oh, bless his holy name. He tells them, don't engage with women that's involved of low character. This is what he's dealing with. It's a trait that's going to be transferred over to the children. One writer has stated that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. And I'm not bashing women. I'm trying to get you to see that our children are learning from somebody. Oh, yes, they are. They're learning from somebody. 
There was an incident not too long ago. Why would a parent in the school system, why would a parent come to a public school and actually encourage the child, listen to this, in front of, watch this, the peers in front of the staff to jump on and fight another child right there in the school. Why would a parent do that? What did you just teach that child? What did you just say to that child? You see what I'm saying? You see where I'm going? So with that being said, it's difficult, ladies and gentlemen, and it's very challenging to raise children in this generation, but it's doable. And it's hard to raise a child to come upright and to stand upright and to live upright. You're talking about raising a child to be straight, but you have a crooked home? No, it don't work like that. Amen, somebody. I believe if living room, the floors of living rooms in America and the world would have God at the center, principles and morals and boundaries at the center of that home, we'd have a better generation, a better culture, a better people. We have taken, allow prayer to be taken out of the home. We say prayer out of school. No, no, no. Prayer is not even in the home in many homes. Hello, somebody. It's one thing for it to be in the school, but what about at home? Hello, somebody. What about at home? So the priest is to uphold certain standards because all eyes, all eyes on me. <laughs> They're watching you. Amen. They're in the trees, the helicopters, in buses. Amen. They're watching you riding down the street. Amen. You're in the shopping mall, wherever you may be. You're out shopping, wherever you are. Somebody's watching you. You may not see them, but I promise you, they see you. Hello, somebody. Now, also we find here that the officiating priest, notice here, is to maintain the highest grooming standards. You know, you have to watch your groom. I'm, I'm grooming. I believe in dressing down and decent. Amen. Uh, I believe in, uh, you don't always have to wear a shirt and tie. I get that. But my God, uh, some of the dress and uh, some of the mannerism of leaders today is really causing people to sway, to think that anything is acceptable now. And that is not so. Hello, somebody. If you notice a businessman looks like a businessman, a doctor looks like a doctor, <laughs> a dentist looks like a dentist, a mechanic looks like a mechanic. Are y'all with a cook, a chef looks like a chef? Hello. Are y'all with me? An athlete looks like an athlete. Are y'all listening to me? Well, so it is with the child of God, and even more so with the leader, amen, that is over God's people, that God has graced you to set in the chair of leadership. I don't take it lightly, amen, I don't take it lightly. It's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Hello, somebody, are y'all with me? The priest was to confine himself to the sanctuary where he offered sacrifices to represent the people of God. This is dealing with his environment. This is dealing with his, amen, his camaraderie, if you would, uh, his peers, his associations. He is, watch this, representing God, right? And as in the case of the priest, the wife of the high priest must exemplify highest character, not only the priest, but also the high priest. Notice here, the high priest must marry a virgin. That's what it says. This is necessary. Um, whereas the priest, uh, they could marry a widow, but the high priest, the high priest had to marry a virgin. So both father and mother contribute to the rearing of a wholesome family. He is to take great care in choosing a suitable wife. You know, you got to be careful. Amen. Now, sometimes you choose somebody you want, but is that the one that God has telemade for you? And there are good women out here. Don't you get it twisted. Just as there are good men. Somebody say, ain't no good men out here. Ain't no good women out here. No, it's just the ones you've been associated with. But God always got somebody. Don't you Don't you believe that? Don't you believe that? God's got some, some good women. God's got some decent, some good kids. God's got some good husbands, some good fathers, some good grandfathers, grandmothers, and grandfathers. I can go on down the line. God's got some people. Yes, he does. Alive and well today. Amen. That are doing those things that are pleasing to God. Now, I've said this before, and I want to share it again with you before we wrap up. 
Please hear me when I say this. You can never fully satisfy God 100%. But you can please God. There are some things that you can please God with. Amen. Yes, you can. Some things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen. Are y'all with me? But you can never fully 100% satisfy him 100%. Why? Because you're not perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But you ought to seek to do those things. That will cause God to smile on you. All glory to his name. I think I'm doing all right. What do you think? Now watch this. The priests, the leadership must take note of what God is saying. Because his seed will succeed him. All right? And he also represents what? Represents God. Standing in behalf of God and his people. The Lord will not allow anyone with physical defects or deformity to officiate in the sanctuary. There are certain duties that they could not perform. Are y'all listening to me? The Lord required animals. And those animals had to be sacrificed without what? Blemish. So he required the same for the priests who represented him. Now, he did not say they had to be perfect. But God did say that there is a certain criteria. I don't know where we get this thing. There's a criteria in the military. <laughs> There's a criteria to be a school teacher. There's a criteria in a profession. Doctor, lawyer, engineer. Criteria, 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 criteria. Do you meet the criteria? Why is it when it comes to leadership in the church? We just take anybody. So much for the criteria. Hello. I didn't say judgment. But so much for the criteria. No, ma'am, no, sir. There's a criteria in God's house. And there's a criteria for those who serve the Lord. Please do not miss that. As a matter of fact, there's a criteria to get in heaven. <laughs> you must be. You got to be born again. Born of his spirit. Washed in his blood. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb. If you ain't born again. Jesus is not going to own you. And Jesus said it so well. No man comes to the Father except by me. And he's not going to be saying, well done, thy good and faithful servant, if you have not what? Done well. Are you with me? Hello? That's a criteria. I don't know where we get this stuff from. Just anybody can, well, you know, uh, he's got a good heart and, and he looks like he'll do and let's give him a try. Well, what about the criteria? Hmm? What about the responsibility? Because with responsibility, there was all, there will always be accountability. And we have people now that just, you know, they want the, the title and the responsibility, but they don't be held accountable. You are accountable. Yes, you are. You're accountable. You're accountable to the laws of God, and you're accountable to the laws of the land. You're accountable. And I, I, don't, I just don't get it. I don't get it when folk just do anything now. I mean, and you have to stand in the gap. One of the most challenging, amen, uh, 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 aspects of my job as a pastor is to try to keep order. There are certain things that I'm not just going to say yes to. There are certain things that I'm just not going to just nod my head. No, it's not okay. No, we're not doing that. And I've had to deal with a lot of resistance. I've had to deal with a lot of anti-ism. <laughs> If that's a word, I've had to deal with a lot of rebellion and pushback because people think the church is like Burger King and they can just have it their own way. What's that old saying? Evil prevails when good people do nothing. That's not only in the world, that's also in the church. Hello, somebody. God has a standard and he starts with leadership. So you be mindful talking about you want to be a leader. James 3 and 1 says, War unto them. Amen. Who teach, who lead, for you shall receive what? The greater condemnation. You read James chapter 3, it's in there. To much is given, much is required. Woe unto you, Sunday school teacher. Woe unto you, youth director. Woe unto you, president of an auxiliary. Woe unto you, pastor. Woe unto you, deacon. Woe unto you, finance team leader. Woe unto you, trustee. Woe, 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 woe. Woe unto you. Because much is given, much is required. And so you see that right here as it relates to the function, the role, 
of a priest. Uh, they are to live according to Leviticus, as we shall see. And uh, as we continue going through chapter 22 and 23, you're going to see that the, the tithes and the offerings, you're going to see the purpose for tithes and offerings. When we return, we'll talk about money. We'll talk about the financing of the tabernacle and of the, um, the rituals and the different services and how they be fine, how the priest is to live and survive based upon, you got it, the giving of the people. Hello, somebody. God has established this in his holy word. And yes, I know we're not living in Old Testament times. I get it. But hear me when I tell you, there are principles that are in the Old Testament that are applicable to us today as it relates to the dispensation or the era or time of grace and mercy and the New Testament scriptures. Oh, please hear me, ladies and gentlemen. Please hear me. No, we don't have to bring animals no more and sacrifice them. Why? Because Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice. He became our sacrifice. No, no, we don't have to have a man to go in and represent us in the great, amen, as a great high priest or as a high priest in the holies of holies. Why? Because Jesus is our great high priest. There are some applications. However, in the Old Testament, they serve as in examples for us. And you see the pattern of God. You see how God deals with his people. You see what God desire, how God desires a closeness with his people. You see how God wants to distinguish his people from other people so that people will know that God is real, ladies and gentlemen. And there is a reality in serving the true and the living God. Hello, somebody. There is a reality. So when we come back, be the Lord's will, we're going to talk more about officiating in the tabernacle of God and consuming sacrifices and procedures for officiating at the altar. And I have procedures as a pastor. Uh, I try to help uh, my preachers and leaders to know there's an order. You know, we do a call to order for worship. Uh, we have order here at Antioch for worship. We just don't throw stuff out there. We have an order that we follow. And this is to help them to understand that God does things decently and in order. God blesses order. And God has called all of us to be good stewards. Whatever field you serve in, missionary, prophet, amen, ministry, leadership, whatever it is, God has called us to be good stewards and to show God a return, amen, on our stewardship. No one is saved to sit. God has saved us not only from a burning hell and saved our souls, amen, in order that we can be with him in the great by and by, but God has also saved us to serve. Hello, to serve. We are servants of the Most High God. Oh, glory to his name. And so I hope and pray that I poured out to you what God has poured into me. And again, this is topical reading. I just want you to, to read the Bible. Because the Bible says over and over again, blessed are them, amen, who just read the Bible, the prophecy. Revelation talks about blessed are they that just read it. That's just read it. But even more so, blessed are they that hear and do it. Hello. Jesus told the boys, and matter of fact, in particular, told Doubting Thomas, he said, blessed are they that have not even seen, but yet believe. What do you believe today? Who do you believe in? Hmm? Get to know the Lord. Amen. If you know him, get to know him closer. Oh, oh the joy of knowing God. For yourself, all the joy of knowing Jesus as your Savior, all the joy that we share as we tarry there like no other has known. The songwriter said, said it so well. Oh, bless you today. You draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. Well, brothers and sisters, this concludes our study uh, tonight in Leviticus chapter 21. I hope you've been blessed. Uh, we ask and encourage you to read ahead. In Leviticus chapter 22 and 23, we'll come back and share uh, with you, amen, by way of study. Uh, we don't have in-house study, in-person study. Uh, we have online study. In the very near future, we're going to seek to have in-house study. 
Yes, we are. We're going to seek to have where we come into the house of prayer and we study the word. And we'll still have it online at the same token. But the Lord has, amen, revealed to me that it's time, past time, uh, for us to come on back into the church. That's right. Set a time. And we're going to have that. And it should be around this time or so. But we're going to have evening study again. Oh, yes, we are. I hope and pray for those of you that are backsliding, members of Antioch in particular, uh, want you to come on back church you miss a lot when you miss church i don't care what nobody say you don't miss church don't miss church and so we're going to have that and you can go ahead and be prayerful pray for us and whether two or three show up amen we're going to kick it off whether two or three show up we'll be walking through the bible we're going to continue our studies we're going to have it in person as well as online amen amen and so we thank god for you if you don't have a church home don't have to look no further we invite you to come and be a part of the Antioch family. You need a covering. Don't let nobody fool you. It's okay to watch, you know, services online, but you need a covering. You need to be in God's house. You need to be under the preaching of an anointed servant of God. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And so we want to pray that the Lord will prick your heart. Uh, there's a fire burning here on the hill. There's a lot of energy. God is stirring up the Antioch church. And we just glorify God for people coming back and people being baptized and people visiting. Thank God for that. But the, it's not over with. No, we we just beginning. Amen. Just beginning. And we want you to be a part of that. So you're welcome to come and share with us and be a part of what God is doing here. And I promise you, the Lord will bless you real good. Yes, he will. Also, we want to pray for those of you that have never professed the hope in Christ. Today's your day. You can do it right where you are. Oh, yes. Please contact us. Reach out to us. Amen. We'll be glad to do what we can to help you in your walk with Christ. We don't have all the answers. I can't perform miracles. I can't turn water into wine. Amen. I, I'm just a vessel. Amen. I, I have to sleep like you do. I have to take care of myself like you do. Hello, somebody. But I just believe if you pray and pray right, and I pray and pray right, something, something is going to happen that will give God the glory. I ain't trying to figure it out. I'm just trying to stay in his will and stay out of his way. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of this ministry. Uh, we also want to say to you that we want to encourage you to visit us online. Amen. And visit our website at AMBC. 1840.org. Many of you have done that. Thank God for you. We also want to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like us on YouTube. Amen. AMBC1840. That's, that's our hashtag. Also on Instagram and X, formerly known as Twitter. I want you to be a part of that as well as we seek to get the word of God out and we're seeking Amen, a venue with Snapchat and TikTok. Amen, trying to reach a dying world. Any venue we can use. Amen, trying to reach a dying world. Also, for those of you that are led of God and you've been blessed by this ministry, we ask that you would sow your seed financially. It takes money to do ministry. It takes money. Uh, I'm not getting rich off of it. It's not coming to me. It's going into the ministry. And it is tax deductible. And you can do that several ways. Um, online giving, your preference is, we have cash out, dollar sign, here it is, AMBC1840. I'll say it again, dollar sign, AMBC1840 is our cash out hashtag. And for those of you that have been utilizing, we thank God for you. Also, Givelify, that's G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y.com, Givelify, G I V E. That's right, L-I-F-Y, givelify.com. Download that app. It's safe and secure. You'll get an email receipt that'll come directly to your email address, and you can take that to your CPA or your accounting. It's called contributions, claiming on your taxes. And I know somebody said, well, I'm not interested in all that, Reverend. Well, God has provided provisions for us to, that's right, to capitalize on some of the taxes we're paying. I don't know about you. 
but I pay a whole lot of taxes. You got cell phone taxes, you got grocery taxes, amen. Taxes on gas, amen. Utility tax, you got all these taxes, amen. You got taxes on top of taxes, on top of taxes. And uh, I want everything, I want all I can get back when I go file my taxes. I tell them all the time, what do I need in order to what? To try to get a return, amen. God has provided that. And so there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong at all. And for those of you that don't utilize online giving, snail mail still works. That's right. All you got to do is fill out your check or money order, pay up to Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, and put a forever stamp on the envelope, drop it in the mail, and the United States Postal Service will deliver it to 428 Ferguson Street, Lexington, Kentucky, 40508. So if you will do that, the Lord will bless you real good. And if you don't have anything to give financially, Amen. Thank you for your time. Amen. Thank you for your prayers. Amen. Thank you for your support. Thank you for sharing this ministry. Thank you for your presence. And we thank God for his power. Let's pray now. Father, we pray for that man or woman, boy or girl that does not know you and the free pardon of their sin. May this be the day of salvation for tomorrow is not promised. And as thousands look at this service and this online Bible study as they hear it and as they go back over and review it and play it back and back and take notes. I pray you would speak to them because, oh God, I know you're speaking to them. And I pray that they would come to understand that you speak to us in many ways, but above all, you speak to us through your word. And so we thank you for that. And we ask that thy will be done. May that man, woman, boy, or girl surrender Profess a hope in Christ and say, I surrender, I yield, I yield. I want to be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Forgive us of our sins, for the devil is a liar. Amen. And thank God. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm signing off here at the Antioch Church, the main campus, here in my office, live, living, and in color. See you next time.